but when we look for concavity, we have to look for where the second derivative is zero or does not exist. So let's look at a function and uh, see if we can determine the intervals where it's either concave up or concave down. Wait, we must look where the second derivative is zero. So we'll have to, we look where the second derivative is zero or does not exist. So our function. What is it convex? What? Concave and convex. <laughs> We're not worried about convex. That's with mirrors. Convex would be concave. Hey, hey, Julia, did I ask you? <laughs> Joey, did we ask you anything? Well, then hush. I asked a question. Uh, Why do you ask a question that you don't want an answer? Enough. Okay, 24 over x squared plus 12. What restrictions do I have on my domain, Ryan? Why no restrictions? Okay, good. No restrictions because nothing would make the denominator equal to zero. So in order to find the second derivative, I have to find the first derivative. Two ways you could do this on this problem. We could use the quotient rule, or we could rewrite this as 24 times x squared plus 12 to the negative 2 and take the derivative there. That's probably a little bit quicker. Not, not to the negative 2, to the negative 1. Thank you. So f prime of x is going to be a negative 24 times x squared plus 12 to the negative 2 times 2x, or a negative 48x over x squared plus 12 squared. All right. If we were looking for critical numbers, what would our critical numbers be, Matt? <coughs> Critical number would be x equals zero. Yeah. All right, we've already determined there's nothing that could make the denominator equal to zero. Okay, but that, that would help me with where's the function increasing and decreasing, but not concavity. So for concavity, we've got to find the second derivative. And so the second derivative, this time we're going to have to use a quotient rule. So we'll have the denominator. times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. And I'm going to have to make this a little smaller. And that's going to be twice x squared plus 12 times 2x all over the denominator squared. If you have any trouble here, it's going to be in finding the second derivatives because sometimes they take a little bit of uh, skill. All right, so if we're looking at this, we have a negative 48 that's common, and we have an x squared plus 12 that's common. So that's what I'm going to factor out, a negative 48 x squared plus 12, and when we do that, we're left with x squared plus 12 minus 4x squared. All over x squared plus 12 to the fourth. I took, uh, here I had a negative 48 and I had a negative 48. You don't have to take the negative, but you can. All right, so. Negative 48, x squared plus 12 minus 48, 4x squared over x squared plus 12. 
Yes, this cancels, and this becomes a 3. And we have a negative 48 times 12 minus 3x squared over x squared plus 12 to the third. Now if I want to check those intervals to see where we have concavity and whether it's concave up or concave down, what did I say we have to check? Where, not the slope, where's the second derivative equal to zero? Or not differentiable. We already said we don't have to worry about the denominator in this case, so I'm going to set the numerator equal to zero. To divide both sides by negative 48 and we get 12 equals 3x squared so x squared is 4 so x is plus or minus 2 all right so that tells us the intervals that we need to check I have to go from negative infinity to negative 2 to negative 2 to 2 and 2 to infinity. All I'm worried about is, is the second derivative positive or negative. So if we check the second derivative in this interval, we could use, say, negative 3. Well, we know that the denominator is always going to be positive, so I don't even have to worry about plugging into the denominator. I'm only worried about the numerator. And if I plug in a negative 3 here, I'm going to have 12 minus 3 times 9. Well, that's negative times negative gives me a positive. So if you, you can put that if you want to, to help you remember what you checked. F double prime at negative 3 is positive, so this tells us that this is concave up. If we checked F double prime at zero. So basically, haven't we just done this? We did it with the first derivative. Now we're doing a very similar thing with the second derivative, but where the first derivative told us where functions were increasing and decreasing and allowed us to find maximums and minimums, the second derivative tells us about concavity. But it's the same procedure. So if we plug in 0 into the second derivative, we're going to have a negative 48 times 12, which is less than 0. So this is concave down. And then if I plug in, again, a, a 3, a positive 3, it's pretty easy to tell that, again, we're going to have a negative times a negative. So we are concave up. And those are the intervals with the appropriate concavity. But couldn't we do it with the first derivative? Okay, we have to use the quotient rule to find the first derivative. So we have the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared. I'll watch and make sure I <laughs> do it correctly. Okay, if we multiply through, we get 2x cubed minus 18x minus 2x cubed minus 4x over x squared minus 9 squared. So that is negative 22x over x squared minus 9 squared. Okay, if I were looking for critical numbers, what would the critical numbers be? Zero. Okay, critical number is x equals 0. Why is plus or minus 3 not a critical number? Because it just means it's not in the domain. It's not in the domain. 
Yeah. All right, it's not in the domain. So let's. Wait, how do we know our domain is not in it? You found it. All right. So now what we want to do is find the second derivative. And I'm going to. So here's our first derivative. Our second derivative is going to be the denominator <coughs> times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator. And I'm going to go ahead and just make this plus times the derivative of the denominator. over the denominator squared. And we can factor out a 22x squared minus 9. And that would leave me with a 9 minus x squared, because i got to distribute that negative. Um, I factored out a 22 this, so we have 4x squared minus 4x squared. No, plus 4x squared. <coughs> Over x squared plus 9 to the fourth. This cancels with one of these, and we have. 3x squared plus 9 times 22 over x squared plus 9 cubed. And that's our second derivative. What values would make the second derivative equal to 0? Uh, what values would make the second derivative equal to zero? Nothing. Why, Andrew? Okay. There is no number we can square that would give me a negative number to make the numerator zero. So that. So how about what? We don't use imaginary numbers in calculus. Okay. If we were using imaginary numbers, then yes, you could use. Uh, square root of 3i plus or minus the square root of 3i, but we're not, so. So, I did notice this was a minus, not a plus here. In my intervals, I had a break in my graph at negative 3 and 3 because of the domain. So even though there's no value where the second derivative equals to zero, I still have some intervals I can check. And those intervals have to do with the break in the graph. I'm going to go from negative three, or negative infinity to negative three, negative three to three, and three to infinity. So if we check our second derivative, at say negative four. Wait, why is it negative three? Why? You got breaks in your graph at those, at those points. So what happens if vertical number is zero? Did, that, did we even have to find that? No, I just said if I'm looking for the critical number, what is it? Oh, okay, so you're just on that. Okay, where'd you get the. How did, we, how did we get those intervals? No, I was um, wondering more about the second derivative. I don't know where I went. Um, <laughs> okay, so Okay, if I plug in a negative 4. Wait, if they're not critical numbers, then why are we getting intervals? This is, from the, this is from the restrictions on the domain. Okay. All right? So if we look at negative, if we plug in a negative 4, well, that's going to be positive, plus this numerator's positive. The denominator, 16 minus 9, that's going to be positive. So it's concave up or concave down? Up. up. All right, if we plug in a zero into the second derivative, 
Well, the numerator's positive, but the denominator's going to be negative. So it's going to be concave down. Zero minus nine is negative nine, and it's cubed. Okay, and then again, if we plug in a positive four, it's going to be positive, so it's concave up. Justin, do you still have that graph in your calculator? I got it. what it looks like. That is concave up on the, in, on the end intervals and concave down in the middle intervals. And you can see the break in the graph. We've got asymptotes at x is plus or minus 3. They are. Okay, so we had to do what? To find points of con to find the intervals, the open intervals on concavity. What did we have to do, Sam? Uh, we had to find um, where the slope was increasing and decreasing. Is that what we just did? It's like you're drawing Christmas trees. <laughs> and how helpful is that going to be? Uh, Caleb, <laughs> <laughs> could you help him out and tell him how we determine our intervals of concavity? Use what the what it couldn't be from the original function. Okay, in this particular one, the, the restrictions on the graph, and then what did we do? What, just in general, what do you have to do to find intervals for concavity? Just in general, not that specific problem, but in general. Naya, what do we do to find concavity? What was the first thing we did? We stated the domain, and then what? You have to find the first derivative so you can find the second, second derivative. Remember it. And so what do we do with the second derivative, Sam? Okay. We look at where f double prime, where the second derivative is zero or does not exist, and that helps us set up our intervals. And then just like we did the first derivative test, we check the second derivative to determine concavity. All right? The, um, it's going to be long. The point at which concavity changes is called the point of inflection. And we have a theorem that helps us to find the point of inflection. If C, F of C is a point of inflection of the graph at F, then either the second derivative is 0 or the function is not differentiable when x equals to C. So if we're going to find the point of inflection, we need to go back, we need to find, and you, you you have to do this in setting up your intervals. You find where that second derivative equals to zero, or the point where the function is not differentiable. That, that could be a point of inflection if you have a vertical tangent line. And you can determine the point of inflection by finding that value where the second derivative is zero and plug that back into your original function. All right, so let's look at an example. Okay, if we have the function f of x equals x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, I want to find the points of inflection and determine concavity. All right, Sam, do I have restrictions on the domain? Uh, no. No, why not? Okay, we don't have any listed? And what do we know about a polynomial function? Uh, oh, it's continuous. Uh, 
Okay, so the first thing we have to do is what, Nyon? What do I do next? What's the, what's the first step here? We've already said there's no restrictions on the domain, so I do what? Find the first restriction. Is that right? I'm sorry. Okay, Nyon, what's the first derivative? Okay, what's the second step, Caleb? Second derivative, which is? Okay. Thank you. I was listening to William. <laughs> okay. Noel, what do I need? If I want to find the intervals to check concavity and the point of inflection, what do I do now? Set the second derivative equal to zero. All right, so we can factor out a 12x, and we get x minus 12, uh, or x minus 2, excuse me. So x, Wait, could you divide 12? So x is 0, or x equals 2. So that helps me set up my intervals. Now, if concavity changes, then I have points of inflection. But if concavity doesn't change, I don't have points of inflection. Okay, so we're going to check from negative infinity to zero, from zero to two, and from two to infinity. So if we check the second derivative, say, at negative one, you can it'd probably be easier to plug it right back in there. That's going to give me a negative times a negative, so we get a positive. Are we, did, you plug it, did you plug it 36? Plug it 36. It's 36. Plug it back into the I plugged it into the second derivative, which gave me a negative times a negative, which is positive. Then if we plug in, say, a 1, we get positive times a negative. Because 12 times negative 1 is negative 12 times oh. negative 3. Oh, okay, I didn't realize you could plug it in that way. Well, I thought we were plugging it in. It's okay. easier to plug it in right here, I think. Yeah, because there are some of the And then if we plug in, say, a 3, we get a positive times a positive. So here we're concave up, Ooh. concave down, concave up. So I have a point of inflection where concavity changes. So when x is 0, I have a point of inflection. And when x is 2, I have a point of inflection. And I usually just abbreviate with POI for point of inflection. How do I find the y value? Plug it into the original. So when x is 0, y is 0. When x is 2, we have 16 minus 32, and that's negative 16. So those are my points of inflection. Those are the points where concavity change. We can use the second derivative to help us test for maximums and minimums. We want to let f, and I didn't have time to type this up, let f be a function. such that f, double, f prime at c equals zero. And that means the critical number, this is a critical number, c is a critical number because f prime of c is zero. And the second derivative exists on the open interval. So f double prime exists on the open interval. Okay, if f double prime of c is greater than zero, which means it's what? Concave up or concave down? Concave, concave up. Then f of c is a minimum. And that makes sense if you think about the fact that it's concave up. You'd have a minimum. 
if f double prime of c is less than zero, then f prime of c is a relative max. Because you are concave down. This is actually a theorem. Okay. Now, if f double prime of c equals zero, then this test fails and you have to use the first derivative test. Okay. Is on page 189, um, 13, 17, 21, 29, skipping around, 35, 49, 51, 53, and 55. 